Hi, it's Alistair here at electricscotland.com. I thought it had been quite a while since I did a, a wee video and newsletter, so I thought, well, you know, it's uh, quite a nice day today, sun shining and so forth, and I thought, well, maybe I'll have a go at trying to give you a bit of an update on what's going on at Electric Scotland and Electric Canadian for that matter. Um, basically, I've just about completed the newsletter for, for this uh, coming week, and uh, I'll be sending it out uh, probably in an hour or so, so you'll get a chance to read it. The newsletter, uh, I've been kind of changing the format a little bit in it. Uh, what I'm tending to do now is within the Electric Scotland news section, I'm actually putting up uh, two or three news stories from Scotland of today. Because as you may know, if you go to electricscotland.com, on the index page of the site, I actually have an RSS feed where I actually make a point every day of putting up stories from the Scottish newspapers and just trying to keep people up to date a little bit with what's going on in Scotland. But I feel there's a, an odd story which I think needs a, a little bit extra explanation and background and so that's what I've done. I've taken to adding maybe two or three stories to the news, um, giving us some background on that. I mean, for example, um, there's a headline at the moment this week which was Early Cairngorm Mountain People Evidence Found. Uh, what it basically is is that they've, the archaeologists in that area, which is around the Mar Lodge estate in Aberdeenshire, have been doing some digging there and they've come up with uh, radiocarbon dates showing that people were living there about 8100 BC, which is at least 3000 years prior to the oldest dates that they thought people lived in that area. So that's uh, pretty amazing. And um, if you're in Scotland, uh, one of the archaeologists is giving a talk around about uh, July 21st or something like that. So if you're in the area you, and interested in that, you might want to go along to that talk. The details are in the newsletter. Um, I've also been uh, a bit concerned uh, over uh, the way the police are handling things in Scotland and I, I noticed an article this time which says Commission raises stop and search concerns with the United Nations. Um, essentially the background to that is that Scotland is doing more stop and searches of people than, than we believe any other country in the world. Um, it's been commented quite a few times in the, in the newspapers or, or over a period of time, but it seems that they've been stopping searching children of under 12 years of age, um, which uh, a lot of people are finding a little bit uncomfortable. But uh, certainly it's got to the point where this particular uh, Human Rights Commission uh, in Scotland has decided that it's it's not really getting much satisfaction from the local government and so it's taking this United Nations. Um, so I, I, I feel it's kind of interesting to look at the background to that because I've been saying for a little bit of time now that I think Scotland's becoming a bit of a police state which I don't really understand why that should happen but it seems to be happening um, under the present government in Scotland and I'm certainly a little concerned about the um, the various news items that come out from time to time. So I thought I'd feature that particular story this time around. Um, I also came across a wee video about the, the last post uh, in, in Yeps um, in, in uh, Brussels, which is a celebration of the, the First World War. And I just thought it was kind of interesting because obviously tons of Scots died in, the, in that war and in that area. So I put a link to the BBC News article about it in which you can watch a video. And I've also highlighted the Tartan Day Parade for 2016 because apparently they're now taking registrations for that event. So I, I will say that I, I'm rather disappointed on the Tartan Day Parade and Tartan Day Week because you never seem to get much real information on what goes on at that event. I have had a poured through YouTube to see if I could find a decent video of the parade in 2015, but I could never find one anywhere. I mean, there's plenty of videos, don't get me wrong, but 
is it's not a cohesive whole. You think you think if they were spending all that money on doing a tartan week that they'd have a proper documentary crew going around and actually filming the all the events that went on, but they don't seem to bother doing that. Uh, and frankly, when it comes to the Tartan Day Parade itself, I was all over the news channels trying to find uh, any reports on it. And frankly, I couldn't really find anything. In fact, the only thing I really found at the end of the day was about Tartan Day Parade in uh, in Buenos Aires, in Brazil. So I don't, I don't know what's going on with that particular event. Anyway, um, this week in Electric Canadian, I'm, I'm certainly apologising. I'm, I'm doing a a book which is reminiscences of a Canadian pioneer for the last 50 years and there's a lot of chapters in that particular book and I'm intended to add one a day but for some reason I've been forgetting to add the chapters and so a few days might go by and I think oh I haven't added another chapter to the book so I then go and add one so it's a bit slower than I'd hoped so I'm, I'm promising to try and do better in future on that but um, the interesting thing is, is I've highlighted this particular chapter that I put up, which is chapter 21, um, because I thought it was quite interesting, and, and the author actually gives a little poem that he actually wrote at the time, which apparently was uh, put to music by the late J.P. Clark of Toronto <coughs> University in the Songs of Canada. But um, that kind of reminded me of uh, Robert Service, now he's a very famous Canadian poet, but I, I will say that um, he's actually a Scot and brought up in Scotland. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, I'll put a wee bit about him in because maybe Canadians and maybe the wider uh, populations around the world haven't heard of Robert Service. But um, unlike, uh, I, I mean, unlike Robert Burns, certainly in Canada, he's very famous. And he ended up being a millionaire. So he obviously did a lot better than Robert Burns. Uh, in fact, uh, his uh, poem, which was, um, it was the shooting of Dan McGrew. Uh, that, in fact, I think I make a comment down here. Yes, the, the, that poem was to go on to earn Robert's service half a million pounds on its own. So it goes to show how successful that was. I've actually found a little book too, which is Songs of a Sourdough, which is by him. And I put a link in the newsletter so you can download the file if you'd like to read other of his poems. And I've also provided a link to Electric Scotland, where I already have a page about Robert Service. But certainly he's quite a character, and it's well worth reading, and his poems, as I say, are, are really great. Um... We've also continued to work with the Enigma machine. If you, I don't know if, if you've looked at the Enigma machine, but basically this is like an alternative to crossword puzzles in a way. It was actually created by Doug Ross, who's a Scots-Canadian, um, and he produced 100 of those puzzles. Uh, basically, um, a lot of them have been printed off and put in doctor's surgeries and dental surgeries and old folks' homes and stuff and they're quite popular. You can actually print the um, the actual puzzle off and on the reverse page you can print the answers. So if you're popping them into surgeries or something like that and people can try and work out the answers, they can actually go to the reverse to get the answers. So, uh, but Hugh Sutherland has been uh, since, because Duke produced 100 of those and then he, he stopped. But uh, Hugh Sullivan's, I think, produced another 12 um, himself. So we we're actually working on those 12 at the moment. I think we're up to 109 at the moment. Uh, so there's another three to go after this one's uh, complete. And I've also mentioned about the Calgary Stampede, which is going on at the moment. Uh, I've given a wee uh, quote by our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, uh, who made a statement of the event. So I've given you the statement to read. But uh, if you want to see the Calgary Stampede, uh, there's plenty of YouTube videos around. Um, basically, he says, an eagerly anticipated Albertan tradition, the Stampede embodies the great Canadian spirit, traditions and values that our nation was built upon. 
For more than a century, this annual internationally recognised celebration has showcased Canada's remarkable pioneer spirit, heritage, culture and Western hospitality. The Stampede is a, a premier tourism event and one of the most recognisable symbols of Canada to the world, attracting over one million visitors every year with its acclaimed rodeos, concerts, stage shows and competitions. Um, and he goes on to say a few things more. Uh, but basically I've kind of highlighted that on, on, on the page. Then I switched to Electric Scotland where um, we're busy doing stories in the Scottish dialect. Uh, I would almost say, you know, these stories dialect should be a must read for anyone interested in Scotland uh, and its culture and heritage and, 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 and history and stuff. They're really, out, in my view, they're outstanding stories. This is actually a selection. These are all done by Alexander Harley. Um, and basically he produced a number of books of stories like this. But uh, I've been working with John Henderson, who's a retired uh, English teacher from Scotland, who's retired to Cyprus. And uh, John um, has found this particular book which is basically selections from the various books he's written. And he's been basically putting them into PDF files and send me one or maybe two each week to put up on the site. And I must confess, I'm making an absolute point of reading each one that's sent in to me. I've really, really enjoyed them. Um, so, again, the link is there to go to the page where you can read all about it. Um, but I'd certainly highly recommend that you, you have a read at them. Uh, also, I'm doing a book with, uh, from Lucy uh, Bethia Colquhoun. Um, she was uh, writing uh, basically about her time in her youth and reminiscing about all these days. And, and actually, uh, again, I've been uh, I, I'm making a habit of also reading those because she mentions all kinds of things in, in her accounts and it's from that that I uh, actually got information on the, the couples that I featured last newsletter. Um, and then I found that Mrs. George Couples was a, an author of children's stories and actually last week I featured one of the stories on the site in, in the newsletter. But um, I don't know, I, I just think even children of today would enjoy these stories, even though they were written about 150 years ago. Uh, but, but I'm finding a lot out about various people as I'm reading her uh, chapters. And of course, when I'm finding a new person that she talks about, I'm going on and doing research to see if, if we've already got information on that person. And if we haven't, I'm then trying to see if we can find any information on the people she mentions. So again, it's um, it's an enjoyable, they're an enjoyable read. At least I enjoy reading them, but of course I, I'm into history big time, so that's why I enjoy all these history accounts. But uh, I like these accounts because it's giving you a bit of an insight into how people lived in those days. Um, the other item I've got in this week's news is about the Weaver's Cottage. It's just a little book, uh, which I happen to come across, but it's uh, a cottage in... Uh, Kibarshan, uh, which I've added to a gazetteer page about Kilbarshan, so you can read about the, the, the town in the gazetteer, but at the bottom I've put a link to that particular book, and it gives a lot of pictures of what the cottage looks like, because it's been preserved as an historical, uh, historical uh, place to go. Um, I've then done a little feature on Scottish independence and Scotland's future, the BBC, maybe a week or so before the referendum on independence, had produced this video uh, which was entitled Scotland Richer or Poorer. Um, and I, I don't know, I just thought I'd, I'd have a wee look at it because I did look at it before, but I thought, well, it was interesting. Uh, but I thought as I watched it today, considering uh, the results of the referendum and everyone's talking about things today, that It'd be worthwhile looking back at that and trying to see 
if you thought it was right, wrong, biased or not biased. So I, I just thought I would actually embed the video onto the page. So if you go to that uh, particular section of the site and the links in the newsletter, you can have a watch of the video. Um, also, this particular week, I'm, I'm following up with work I've been doing for a, a little while now, is trying to get more information on the sets of clads. Now, I don't know if you've, you may not have noticed, but because I work with all the clans, as it were, I've noticed that a lot of them are now starting to say names associated with the clan, whereas earlier it was always the set list. Now, a set list, basically, are, I, I would just say that only the clan chief is allowed to add a set name or a name to that set list of the clan. No one else can. And if you don't have a clan chief today, then you cannot add any more names to that list when it was produced because it was only the chief that could add the names to the list. Now, the way we, we still don't quite know why a lot of names have been added to a set list. We can assume that maybe some of the names have been due to marriage or because there was a political tie-up between the people of that particular name and the, and the chief himself. Um, but the problem is that as you do research, while the name is there listed, there's usually never any information about that name, which irritates me no end, I have to say. And I just wish that the clans that still have a set list and still produce it would at least give us some information about these names. I mean, even if they said we have no information, then at least that means that we could start to do research. But they just produced the list. And as far as I'm aware, no clans really make a real effort to give you any information on any of these sets. I have talked to a few clan chiefs, and I will say that they reckon they know why maybe one or two names are on that list, but they also admit that they don't know why others are on that list. And that's actually because they inherited the list from, obviously, their, their father, the previous chief. And because perhaps at that younger age they were never that intimately involved with the clan as such, they never actually inquired of the chief why those names were on that list. And so they've ended up with a list that is official from the clan standpoint, but actually don't know why the names are added. So I feel there should be more research going into that. Uh, I mean, I looked at clan, uh, I think it's either Buchan or Buchanan, I can't quite remember which one now, but they have um, a huge list of SEPs, a huge list. And trying to find any information on the names is, is like a nightmare. Uh, I have been able to find some links. However, to get a long story short, this is what I've been working on these last few weeks. And in particular, I worked the, this week on Clan Maxwell. Um, Basically, I think I found information on most of the steps on, on, in Clan Maxwell. So again, uh, I've given you a link to the Clan Maxwell Index page, where if you look at the set list, you'll see there's links now there. And those links are either to further information that we have in our own site, or perhaps to PDF books about the name. <coughs> um, likewise, I've worked on the, the Robertson and Bruce clans uh, this particular week, so there is information, more information available. Like for under Robertson, who's the Donaghy clan, um, I've got Robertson small and related families of Hamilton, Livingston, McNaughton, McDonald, McDougall, Beveridge, uh, Lowry, and Stewart by Archibald Robertson Small. This is a book he produced in 1907. So I put a, a, a link to that book from the Robinson clan page. Um, and likewise, I've managed to add a few more links to the Bruce clan because uh, I found more information about those sets and, and so I've added that. Um, 
while I've been working through these kind of things, I also came across some information on Ralph Ward Law. Um, and I, I thought, oh, that's rather interesting. I, I thought, have I got any information on Ralph Ward Law? And when I actually do a search on my site, I've actually got in my famous Scots pages. So I've taken the book and I've now added a link to the book on his page. So if you'd like to read more about him, you can. Um, I also came across, just pure by chance, on the history of Mid Calder. I found I didn't have a history of Mid Calder on the site, but I have got a history of West Calder. So I thought what I'd just do is add that book um, on Mid Calder to the foot of the West Calder page, because I presume if you're reading about West Calder, because Mid Calder is next door, as it were, you might be interested in just reading that at the same time. So I've got a link up there. I've also got a, a reference to Alexander Hamilton. Now, I actually got an article in from uh, Gary Giannotti, who is from the USA and has been researching the uh, great seals of the USA uh, and also the, the flag of the USA. And uh, in his research, you see, came across uh, information about Alexander Hamilton and therefore sent me in a wee article about him. Um, he was the, the first U.S. Treasury Secretary of the United States. And so I was having a, a wee look at uh, his biography and I just started reading it. I wasn't necessarily going to do anything about it, but I, I don't know, I just, I kind of, I got about halfway through it and I thought, I'm really enjoying this and it's most interesting. So I thought, ah, and I got a copy of the, the book uh, as a PDF and I've added it. Uh, to uh, his page on the site. So uh, there's now a page about him there. Um, I also, uh, because of that, I, I also found some information on, on President James Buchanan, one of the presidents of the USA. He actually comes from a Scots-Irish background, but um, I've added a biography of him to our Clan Buchanan page. So I'm, I'm, I'm gradually adding more information to the clan pages, either individuals or more general information. I also noticed that there was a, a news item about Ravenscraig site memorial um, unveiling, which is paying tribute to the steel workers. Um, if you've been in Scotland or know much about Scotland, you remember Ravenscraig was the largest steel plant virtually in Europe. It was huge. But because of the machinations of the, of the EU, they closed the whole thing down and put thousands of people out of work. And it was a really good steel mill, profitable. But the EU decided that they didn't need as many steel mills in the whole of Europe and decided Scotland could be sacrificed. And so that's just another reason why we shouldn't be in the EU, because they've already destroyed 100,000 jobs in our fishing industry and they've destroyed thousands of jobs in the steel industry. So we no longer have a steel industry in Scotland as a result. So I thought uh, I would just make a wee article. I, I gave a link to the article about it. Um, I also came across um, uh, Edward Caird. There's a mention about him. Uh, again, it was one of the books I was reading. And I thought, have I got anything on him? Um, and I actually, I had a little information on him, but this is a book about the life and philosophy of Edward Caird. And I thought it'd be good to add that to the, the small biography I already had on him. And so that's been added uh, to the site this week. Um, another thing I've been doing recently is um, telling a story in the newsletter. I'm still not 100% certain whether people enjoy it or not because I don't get a lot of feedback, unfortunately. If you don't get feedback, you're kind of working in the dark. But I thought the idea of the story was to put a story that, you, that was a good read, like a chapter of a book. Um, so over the last several weeks, I, I've been adding an actual story to the newsletter. This week is about Donald McLeod's gloomy memories. Um... I've had that book on the site for quite some time because obviously it's all to do with the Highland Clearances and uh, his uh, stories about that uh, were 
it was like really good reading uh, for people that wanted to delve into the Highland Clearances. And in particular, he was writing about the Sutherland Clearances, of which he knew a great deal. And um, basically, the, the people that produced this book, they did say, well, if I, I'll read it to you here. It says, it originally appeared as a series of letters in the Edinburgh Weekly Chronicle. These letters were afterwards published separately in a thick pamphlet, which has long become so rare in this country that no money will procure it. After a search of more than 20 years, we were fortunate enough to pick up a copy of the enlarged Canadian edition in Nova Scotia during a visit there in 1879. The letters originally published in this country are given in the following pages in the form in which they first appeared, with the exception of a slight toning down in two or three instances. So what I'm doing in this particular copy of the newsletter is giving you the first three letters and then a link if you want to read the rest of them. Um, but certainly it makes gloomy reading for sure. But, you know, it was a very bad time in our history, these Highland Clearances. And again, if you were trying to research more into that, you'll find that I have on the site an article about how these small crofts could have been made very profitable if they'd been worked differently. Um, and a very knowledgeable uh, person wrote the book to demonstrate how on a small acreage of, of, of land, not only could they have uh, grown enough uh, food for themselves, but actually had enough left over as a cash crop. So not only could they have paid increased rent, but they would have even had some cash over and above to buy a few luxuries. But because they weren't helped or trained to run the craft properly uh, they did it the old way which is extremely inefficient and was the reason that most of them couldn't pay the rent so I, I think this is a combination thing that if the landlords had spent more time with their existing crofters and, and tenants and helped them they actually would have been better off than kicking them off and putting sheep in their place but of course, history is a great hindsight to all that. But uh, I think it's still a lesson that people can learn in other parts of the world. So that essentially is the, the newsletter for this week. Um, in general, uh, I'm actually putting more up as PDF books because I'm finding that people are finding it easier if they enjoy the book to actually print out pages from the PDF. Um, rather than trying to print them from the site. So uh, while I'm still doing as much research as ever, I'm not spending as much time OCRing books onto the site as I once did. So, and I'm also finding that I'm coming across biographies of people that I've already got many biographies on the site and like in our famous Scott section. Um, because at that time, they, remember the, the famous Scott section is mainly based on the, the um, the book about eminent Scots, it was uh, by Chambers. He wrote, uh, I think it was four volumes, but a fifth volume was, was later added to the collection by someone else. But clearly at that time, these biographies hadn't been written, and so he was writing his own biographies of these people. But over the years, bigger, more detailed biographies have been written and published. So when I'm finding these, I'm trying to add a link to the book onto these biography pages. Um, so that's just a, a kind of background on that. So uh, anyway, um, there you go. That, that's uh, the newsletter for uh, July 10th. It will be going out very shortly. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this wee uh, description of what's in it. And uh, if you like it, let me know and maybe I'll do some more frequently than I've been doing in the past. But that's essentially what you've got in this week's newsletter. Hope you enjoy it when you read it and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>